Hey, everybody, and welcome to our April monthly buzz. Um, it's wonderful to be with all of you today. Um, it's always a pleasure, and I'm excited to be here in April, which is the busiest month of the year, essentially, for beekeeping almost across the country, no matter where you're from. So exciting times. Great to be with you guys. If we haven't met, my name is Blake Shook. Um, I'm one of the owners of the Bee Supply and a, a long-time small-scale sideline and commercial beekeeper. So kind of uh, dabble in almost everything. And one of my favorite things to do is get on these calls once a month and uh, talk about practical beekeeping and what you need to be doing in your bees right now to be a successful beekeeper. Because, you know, beekeeping is tough. Uh, it's tough even if you've been doing it over 20 years like I have. Um, it's still just as much fun, um, but it is not always easy. And so what we really try to do is to be practical and simple and really uh, break down beekeeping to its simplest possible components uh, for us all. So um, we've got a lot of ground to cover tonight and April being such a busy month for beekeeping. Uh, we have a lot to accomplish. We have a lot to cover. James and Sherry are going to be talking about splits uh, towards the end of the presentation, which is always a fantastic presentation to uh, learn and hear this time of year. But I really want to thank all of you for taking your evening to come and learn about beekeeping with, with us. So thanks for your time and let's dive in. So if you're in the local area, we do still have some bees for sale. A lot of those early dates are full at this point. But um, you still can jump on our website and order bees if you are short bees. And of course, we have that 30-day guarantee in place. Uh, so if anything goes wrong with your bees, then of course, it's a free replacement for the first 30 days. This is really taking off. Um, I, I'm so excited about it. I talked about it quite a bit last month. Um, but scan that QR code. It'll take you to a video um, talking about our bee warranty. And, and we're the only ones that do this. Uh, we're the first ones to do it. Uh, it's it, We might be the last ones to do it. <laughs> we'll see. Um, but it essentially guarantees if you, if you buy a warranty for your bees, um, then if you lose your bees, then we will replace them the next season. Uh, if you don't use the warranty, then uh, we refund you 50% of, of the purchase price. So if you're new to beekeeping, you may not realize that it's really, really normal to lose bees. Most of us lose a good percentage of our hives every year. If you've been in beekeeping for a couple of years, then you know that, oh, yeah, um, this might be helpful because it's not uncommon to lose my bees. So we wanted to find a way to help you stay in beekeeping, even with losses. Um, this is only valid for a couple more months, so we will not, uh, we'll stop taking uh, bee warranty applications after the 1st of June. So you've got uh, just a little bit more time to sign up for this before we, uh, we'll, can't, we'll end it. Uh, and then we'll, we'll do it again in 2025 if you buy bees in 2025. So check this out. I think you'll find it tremendously helpful um, in your journey of uh, beekeeping. Sherry, tell us what is going on with this gorgeous cover and uh, this 46th edition of the magazine. Can you believe? I love that cover. The, this young lady did such a great job with the front cover. She got the back cover too. It's a different photo, but the same plant, same. I don't think it's the same bee. We'll pretend like it's the same. I don't know. Anyway, gorgeous cover. I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, wow, boy, how do you talk about this program being packed? This magazine's packed too, because we're talking about splits, requeening and swarms and dabbling into um, nectar flow. So it is truly packed full, packed full, good long articles. I think y'all are all going to love them. Making successful splits. And James and I, like you said, we're going to talk about that a little tonight. How to tell if your hive is queenless or needs to be requeened. Hmm. That's never happened to us. Never. Hmm. How about you? How to tell if your nectar flow has started and it's time to add supers. And I think a lot of us question that. You get to the point where you go, okay, so do I add it? Do I not, do, what, which one do I do? And this is going to talk about that, that some hives you do, some you don't. So read that article. 
Um, and I love this. Our, our friend and, and who we love very dearly, Lynn Jones, that writes for us every month, her son is a professional bee remover, and he wrote an article that I titled A Window into the World of Bee Removals. His name is Bee Man Dan, and it's a great little article, y'all. Take a peek at that, because I think if you've got an interest in doing that, it might give you an insight, either make you want to do it more or make you not. So yeah, whoever you are, you might not find that. All right, I'm ready to do my spotlight. If you got that slide, do you have that slide this, this time? Yay! Okay, so last month it kind of got out of the way, but we got it this time. Um, so this picture is, I got to make it bigger on my screen, changing the attitude of a hot hive. That's just my fancy way of saying I've got a hot hive. What am I going to do? Well, it has a lot to do with requeening, right? But I, I've, I've watched social media pretty closely and some people like to work with hotter hives or meaner bees because they are, they do tend to uh, be a little better, a little more aggressive at keeping Varroa out and pretty good honey producers. We can attest to that. But um, the older I get, the less tolerant of that. Plus, I'm pretty darn spoiled to our sweet bees that we get. Um, we've got some pretty sweet bees. He just moved out of the camera. Did you see that? Um, so I, it's a little more difficult than just requeening. And, and I don't know. I guess everybody does this, and we didn't invent it. But years ago, we figured out that if you just split that hive into as many little hives as you can possibly do, pack them all in one location you know side by side or in a circle or whatever and then go back a few days later first of all you're going to know where the queen is because that's where most of the bees went back but you'll be able to find her because you're making two and three frame splits but i go into detail in this article about how to just water that water it down where you can find her because i i will tell you having worked a hot hive or two you get in there and try to requeen and you're looking for and looking for you can't find her she's she is protected by the masses so you just even the the playing field a little bit check back in a few days then you can requeen easily easily but the last bullet point I highlighted so I could tell you is boy you will want to button up for this event if you don't have a full suit get one if you do have a full suit, pull out the duct tape. Duct tape every juncture that you can find because they are going to find a way in your suit. But anyway, it's a good article. I hope you all enjoy it. That's all I got till the end of the program. We'll do the splits portion for you, Blake. Awesome. Thank you, Sherry. That was great. Yeah, I love that article. So, so relevant. I mean, if you've had a really hot hive, uh, man, you need the tips in that mag in that article. It's so so helpful. There's nothing like trying to requeen a really nasty hive. I mean, it's it's brutal. It's brutal. A um, couple more quick things before we jump out to the bee yard. So this is something kind of cool. It's just an experiment we're doing. Um, we're selling leaf cutter bees, and so this is for people that um, maybe you can't keep your bees in your backyard. Uh, maybe you have HOA rules. Um, maybe you, you know, for whatever reason, you can't keep your bees where you might have a little garden. Uh, maybe your bees all died and you're not sure you want to get back into beekeeping. But we're just trying this out, seeing how it goes. Um, we're, we're selling leaf cutter bees. And so these are cheap, uh, really cheap. And you can put them in your garden and they'll hatch out and uh, pollinate your garden. And then uh, that's basically it. You basically just put this, you, we sell this little box. The leaf cutter bees are already in there, the, the little larva. Uh, when you get it, you put it out in your garden, and uh, that's it. They pollinate your garden. <laughs> so it's almost too easy. Um, now, of course, they don't make honey. So that you know, they're not nearly as much fun as bees. But if you need some pollination and bees aren't a good fit for you, we're trying this out to, to see how it goes. And if it really takes off, we'll do a bunch of videos showing how it's done and all that. But uh, we're, we're just experimenting. You guys are always our guinea pigs on our monthly uh, buzz. And so uh, here you go. We're, we're going to see what happens. The last thing I want to highlight is our Hive IQ. So we're we're big supporters of APAME and we sell a lot, a lot of APAME equipment, that insulated Hive. We certainly recognize that APAME is expensive and it's not a good fit for everyone uh, who might want insulated hives. Uh, insulated hives are helpful 
not critical. I always try to emphasize that you can be a perfectly successful beekeeper without insulated hives, but they do a little better over the hot summers and the cold winters if the hive is insulated um, like a tree. You know, bees in the wild live in trees that have an amazing R value, but in thin wooden boxes we put them in, there's not as much of an R value. Again, they can survive just fine in the wooden boxes, but it does give hives a leg up. They do tend to carry more brood in the summertime. They tend to stay a little bit stronger in insulated hives. And so for those that are like looking at that app of May and you're like, uh, yeah, no, I'm not going to spend, you know, 500 bucks or whatever it is to get started with an app of May hive. The hive IQs are much cheaper and, uh, and they still last a really long time. They don't have a lot of the special features that app of May have has, but they provide a similar insulation. So um, check those out if you're interested. We just started carrying those. Uh, it's kind of the economy insulated hive. Okay, let's jump out in the bee yard. I, I made this bee yard segment today a little bit shorter, um, partly because um, I was filming it right before I got here to get on this call. And so that's part of the reason it's shorter. But then we just have a lot to cover tonight. So we're not going to spend quite as long in the bee yard. And then the first video you're going to see is one I filmed at a different location uh, looking for eggs. And then we'll jump into our normal bee yard segment. So let's see what the bees are up to. And uh, then we'll jump back into the normal presentation. Hey, everybody. So something we're going to look at today is how to find eggs in a hive. It's, it's a really, really common question um, for, for all beekeepers, not, not just new beekeepers, but, uh, you know, it's a common question for any beekeeper. You know, how do you find eggs? Eggs are super hard to find. I mean, eggs are smaller than a grain of rice and they're buried down in the bottom of this dark little cell in dark honeycomb. And it's just really, really tough to see them. Before I get into some tips and tricks on how to find eggs, I wanna go over really quickly uh, the fact that you don't always have to find eggs in a hive. It's a helpful tool to have, but it's not necessary to find eggs every time you look in your hive. If you have a hive that is healthy, it's growing, you see capped brood, you see larva, uh, you do not see queen cells all over the place, there's no reason to find eggs. You've got a laying queen 95% of the time. On the other hand, if you've got a hive that uh, you don't see cat brood, you don't see larva, uh, maybe you see queen cells all over the place, okay, they might be queenless and you need to find eggs. But nine times out of 10, all you need to do is see cat brood, a good bee population, and do not see queen cells and you probably do not have to find eggs. Even if you've got a brand new nook or a brand new hive home, you don't have to feel pressure to find the queen and find eggs. All you need to do is see cat brood, you see larva, you don't see queen cells, and you're probably just fine. So don't, don't stress too much trying to find eggs. Um, just learn to identify cat brood, learn to identify larva, and you're probably good to go. But if you do wanna find eggs, I'm gonna show you some tips and tricks on how to do that. So some tools that are really, really helpful, and I'll show you how to use them. A flashlight, so bring a flashlight out to the bee yard. Um, I know it's super bright out here, but a flashlight is still super helpful. And then your smartphone. So bring your flashlight and bring your smartphone. And these are two really, really helpful tools to finding eggs. And I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. But you're gonna open up your hive. Now eggs are usually gonna be mostly on frames that do not have a tremendous amount of cat brood because there's got to be open cells for the queen to lay in. So we want to find frames that are usually on the outskirts of the brood nest that are not completely full of cat brood because if they're completely full of cat brood, uh, there's nowhere for that queen to lay. So this frame is a picture perfect example. So we've got We've got a bunch of cat brood around the edge, as you can see around the edge. So there's capped honey up here. We've got a ring of cat brood right here. And then the whole center of this frame is apparently empty. You know, at a glance, you might say, well, that frame doesn't have any brood on it. When in fact, it's completely full of eggs and larva in those cells that look empty. It's just tough to tell because it's hard to see down in those cells. So if I see a ring of cat brood around the edge of a frame like this, 99% of the time, the inside of all those cells is full of eggs and larva. 
So this is actually a complete frame of brood, but you wouldn't know it if you couldn't see down into, the, into those cells and see those eggs or those teeny tiny little larvae. So the number one thing when you're trying to find eggs is adjust, those, adjust these frames so the sunlight is shining directly down into those cells. So wherever the sun is, adjust this frame so that you can see the sunlight is shining directly down into those cells and that's really gonna help you see eggs. Once that sunlight is suddenly glinting off the bottom of those cells, it is way easier to see eggs and larvae. If it's not a bright, bright sunny day, that's where your flashlight comes in. So get your flashlight, turn it on, especially if it's a cloudy day, and just shine your flashlight down into those cells so that you can see eggs and larvae. That flashlight is super, super helpful. Just shine it into those cells. The other thing you can do is get your smartphone and take a bunch of pictures at varying heights above that above those cells and then maybe take some videos at varying heights above those cells and then you can go inside where it's darker and you can zoom up on those pictures with your smartphone zoom up on them or zoom up on the video and see if you see eggs and larvae but you can do this on three or four of the frames in the center area of the brood box um, and look for those eggs, look for those larvae, and that'll help tremendously. Nine times out of 10, you're gonna see eggs in this center area of the brood box. So that's where you need to focus most of your time and attention, um, rather than the extreme outside edges or frames that are completely full of cat brood or completely full of honey. Um, but that's it, I mean, use your flashlight, use your smartphone, um, let the sunlight shine directly in the bottom of those cells, and remember, if you have cat brood, you do not see queen cells all over the place, you're probably fine. Another thing you can do if you don't see eggs and you don't see larvae and you don't see cat brood, wait a few days and go back and look again. You could have a new queen that is just starting to lay eggs and it takes you know five days after they hatch from an egg to be capped over. And so you might just need to give them four or five more days and go back and then you'll start seeing that cat brood. So those are my best tips on finding eggs and larvae. If all else fails, then take a bunch of pictures and send them to your mentor or send them to us at Texas Bee Supply. And we'd be more than happy to look at those frames and those pictures and say, yep, you know, we do see eggs and larvae, we do see brood, or no, this hive is queenless. So is my hive ready to split? Hey, this is Blake, Blake Shook with the Bee Supply. And that's a good question. You know, how do you know if a hive is ready to split or not? It's often dictated by, can you get queens or not? <laughs> if you can't get queens, you probably don't need to make a split. You should probably just keep adding boxes to prevent swarming until you, get, you can get queens. But let's say your queens are a week or two away and you're checking your hive, making sure that it's ready to split. What are you looking for? It's pretty simple. I'm looking for an adequate number of brood, bees and a sufficient amount of brood. If they don't have at least six frames of brood and at least, you know, one to one and a half boxes full of bees, I'm not gonna split it. So when I look at this hive, before I smoke them, you know, this top box has about seven frames full of bees. So there's seven frames of bees. I'm looking on the bottom box. There's about four frames of bees on the bottom. Seven, eight, nine, so that's 11 frames. I'm just gonna quickly make sure they've got at least six frames of brood, because in general, I wanna put at least three frames of brood per split. So we've got, hey, hey, we've got brood and I even see the queen on this frame. So queen's on this frame. We've got a good frame of brood. One, two, three. Make sure this one's brood. So I've got four frames of brood upstairs. I'm gonna quickly check downstairs. Make sure I've got a couple frames down here. Okay, so that's a frame. Five, six, seven. I can often just look between the frames and tell. So this one has about seven frames of brood and about a box and a half full of bees. So this one's good to split. Now at this point, the split is as simple as equalizing the brood. I'm gonna make sure I've got about three and a half frames of brood in the bottom, 
about three and a half frames of brood in the top. Make sure I've got the same amount of honey in the top and bottom box. And then I don't like having to look for the queen. So I'm just gonna shake all the bees into the bottom box, put a queen excluder on it, put my top box back up, up, up on top. Now I know my queen's downstairs because I just shook all the bees down there. I'm gonna let it sit for four or five hours until it gets dark. The worker bees will migrate back up and cover that brood. And then once it gets dark, I'll just pull this top box off, put it on a bottom board with a cover, and I've got my split made. It can be as simple as that. Hey friends, Blake Shook here. So it's spring, that means it's swarm season. One of the biggest things I'm watching for this time of year is, is my hive getting ready to swarm? That's always a concern, right? We don't wanna lose our bees to swarms. Now, for my operation, it's pretty simple. In late March or early April, we're splitting every hive that's splittable, no matter what. We talk about whether a hive is ready to split or not in another video, but in general, every hive is getting split no matter what, and that really reduces my concerns about swarm. So if you wanna split your hives, if you wanna grow your hive numbers every year, just splitting as early as you can get queens usually works. But if you've got a hive that's really strong in early March, or a month before you get queens, that's when you have to take action. So let's look at a hive and see what does it look like or what should we watch for if we're concerned about swarming? Or what are some of the trigger points of swarming? Now, the biggest one is just how, high, how full your hive is. I mean, if your hive is really full of bees, and on this hive you can see this top box, as I look down between these frames, every, in between every single frame is completely full. That's concerning when your top box is 100% full of bees. And as I look on the bottom box, it's the same. The bottom box, in between every frame, it's full of bees. So this hive is gonna swarm soon because we're coming up to the honey flow. And if I don't split it or add a box soon, it's going to swarm. Now, the concerning thing about this hive is they are definitely getting ready to swarm. They may even already have swarmed. If you look at the bottom of this box, hopefully you can see it. I can't hold it and uh, maybe I can. Here's a queen cell. And this is where you often see swarm cells is on the bottom of the hives. So here's a swarm cell, here's a swarm cell. These are the queen cells that they've already put on the bottom and it's because they are getting ready to swarm. And so I'm gonna hold that and see if you can see the, hopefully you can see it. Uh, those are signs that this hive is getting ready to swarm. Now, once a hive has already started raising these swarm cells, it's pretty much pointless to just wipe out those swarm cells. They're generally gonna swarm anyway. So what I would do at this point, I would just make a split. And I've already got my queen cells ready to go. I'm gonna make sure one queen cell gets in every split and that'll completely shut down swarming. If I just wipe out those queen cells, odds are you'll miss one and they'll swarm anyway. Alternatively, if I were to just add a box, Again, that's not enough to halt that swarming impulse once they've already begun getting ready to swarm. If there weren't any swarm cells, and I'm still a few weeks from getting my queens, adding a box on top or adding a box between the bottom board and the bottom box should hold them over until you get queens. Okay, so there you go. That was a quick one out in the bee yard. And let's jump back into the classroom if you will you know it's funny um every every time we do one of these monthly buzzes um i have a uh i have an iphone oh hang on guys there we go i have an iphone i have an imac and then i have an, an apple watch and every time um i say hey sherry in the video all my devices go off thinking i'm saying siri so uh, <laughs> if the audio ever cuts out, it's like, it's because I accidentally said, that, hey, uh, Mrs. Elam, and then all my devices go crazy thinking I'm, thinking I'm trying to talk to Siri. So, um, all right. So I want to go over really quickly. Uh, I know this isn't super practical beekeeping, but it's just too much fun not to share for a moment. And that is, uh, you know, I've shown you guys some pictures of almond pollination in California, I even did some video tours and past uh, monthly buzzes of, of almond pollination in California. And so 
we're done with California for the year. You know, all the bees are home. Everybody's bees are sent home. You know, the, the bloom is over. California is kind of in the bag for the year, which is such a relief. Uh, we're all uh, a little worn out and then ready to be home. But what, one thing we did this year that was pretty fun is we actually took a big group out to California. And, and I, I talked about it, I think, in our January monthly buzz. But um, we, were, we were doing a promotion where, hey, you could pay and take a trip to California with us and experience the almond pollination. So we did that in early March, and it was such a blast. And for those of you that couldn't make it this year, um, I'm going to give you some pictures and just a quick rundown of, of what you would have seen if you had gone. We, we will probably do it again. We're trying to figure out, you know, how and when and where, but we'll probably do some of these kind of experiential tours to uh, California and then maybe even North Dakota and, and other regions. But this was the group. Um, this was at our primary location where we uh, everyone uh, gathered together and we, we uh, kind of looked at some bees that we had there on site. We explained how we receive bees into holding yards and then distribute them out into the almond orchards. Uh, we rented a big van. And so this is almost everybody. Some people didn't fit in the van. So we had a couple people driving in cars, but uh, we had a big, uh, a big bee van and looked like a bunch of folks that are responding to a chemical spill every time we piled out of the car or a big hazmat team. Um, this was the group standing in an almond orchard. You can see uh, the almonds were in full bloom. Uh, this was, we started the day actually in an almond orchard, a more mature almond orchard that had finished blooming. And that's, this is a very common look. It's just beautiful. It looks like a beautiful lawn and there's hundreds of thousands of acres, you know, over a million acres like this, where you can just see these beautiful rows of almond trees and kind of this manicured lawn. They keep it mowed, they keep it trimmed, um, and just these beautiful almond orchards. This was an almond orchard that was in full bloom. Uh, usually it's easy to find almond orchards in full bloom until, you know, mid-March, but this particular year, the almonds ended early. And so by the time we went out there with this team of folks, this was like the last almond orchard we could find that was in full bloom. It took us a bit of hunting to find it, but you can see there's a lot of petal fall. It looks like just snow on the ground and that's those petals falling off the trees. Uh, but there's still enough on the trees to, you know, kind of see that full, beautiful, beautiful white bloom. We looked at some bees, of course. We can't be a group of beekeepers and not look at bees. So we looked at bees. We tasted almond honey, and everyone in the group agreed that the almond honey was absolutely disgusting. Um, <laughs> almond honey is, if you can imagine a bitter honey, almond honey is just very bitter. It's gross. Um, and uh, it was, just, you know, but it was fun, right? It was an interesting experience. And of course, um, this was uh, just looking at some bees. You can see all the drone brood on top of the hive. If you remember in last month's monthly buzz, we talked about, hey, all that drone brood on those top bars, that's a good thing. That means the hive is really healthy, really strong. It's got excess capacity to raise all these extra drones between the two boxes. And out in California, strong hives, you know, almost every one of them you open looks like this because that almond pollen is just so nutritious um, and, uh, and, and good for the bees. And Talk about product placement. Look at that. That was not intentional, but there we've got the super smoker and we've got our tactical gloves there. Um, you can see that when I'm doing this kind of work, I am wearing real bee gloves. I'm not just wearing those nitrile gloves like you often see in the videos. I, the nitrile gloves are helpful for really quick tasks in the bee yard, especially if I'm operating camera equipment and they prevent most things. But if I'm really working bees, I'm definitely wearing a, a traditional uh, or one of these new tactical pairs of, of gloves. Uh, this was the last almond orchard we looked at for the evening that the bees were in. You can see this one's about two thirds of the way through with bloom. Most of the petals are on the ground, um, but uh, you know the, the almond pollination is, is largely done in this orchard. And then we wrapped up the evening in one of our holding yards in the foothills of California. So the Central Valley, of course, is a valley. And if you go to either end, you run into mountains. And so on the far western end, we have a several hundred acre holding yard where uh, we overwinter a lot of bees. So a lot of bees, ours and other people's sometimes uh, spend the winter in California in, in this holding yard. And it's really pretty good for the bees. It's away from a lot of the heavy duty agriculture. There's a lot of wildflowers in the foothills and uh, it's hard to beat the views. Uh, you, you may not think of the Central Valley as gorgeous views, but 
pretty beautiful in this holding art. I, I never mind spending some time in uh, in this particular location. It's pretty beautiful. So yeah, that, that's it. I mean, fun time. Uh, hopefully some of you can join us next year. Right now, our focus has shifted to making splits, building nooks, building singles, creating packages. Um, our crews are all back home here in Texas, and uh, we're we're building bees that will be distributed all over the United States for for beekeepers. And so now uh, it's it's kind of um, what is the saying? I always butcher it. You know, out of the uh, out of the frying pan into into the whatever. You know, you get you, you remember the the saying. Um, you know, so our crews are just as busy as ever, and we've got about two more months of craziness, splitting, selling nook, selling bees. And then we can take a bit of a deep breath uh, in, in the early summer until we start producing a lot of honey in the Midwest up in uh, uh, in July and August. So there's just some of our crews making hives and doing splits. And we usually do about a th- you know, it depends on, you know, one one crew, one of our crews will do about a thousand splits or make about a thousand units a day. Um, and that, that's kind of a normal day for, for one large crew. So, oh, and let me just show this really quickly. This is just, I show this every year just because it's so cool. These are some queen cells we had hatch out in an incubator. And uh, I always just, I love watching it. It's just a queen hatching out. You can see there's one that's already hatched in the background. You see some of those queen cells that have the lid open, the queen hatched out. And uh, in this video, the queen just is chewing her way out and makes, she makes it look easy. That's, it never gets old to watch a bee hatch. It's always pretty cool to see a actual queen bee hatch as well. All right, let's talk about practical beekeeping. Enough of the, uh, enough of the, fun, uh, non-practical stuff. Let's talk about what we need to be doing in our bees this time of year. So lots of stuff is blooming. Everywhere things are blooming. If, if you're in the deep south, you know, things have been blooming forever. And, and if you're further north, things are just starting to bloom. Wide varieties of flowers, strong pollen flows in a lot of areas. What I'm seeing in most areas is that brood rearing is reaching its peak production in the south and in the west. Hives are exploding in strength. Hives are forming. You're kind of at that peak strength now. Um, in the northern states, brood rearing is starting to ramp up. So it's certainly not at a peak yet in far northern states, but it's, you know, your brood rearing is kicking in. Your hives are starting to rear brood. And that'll approach a peak within the next month or so, depending on how far north you are. There's a tremendous pollen flow everywhere except the very far northern states. Even there, a lot of areas are starting to see a trickle. Um, I think I saw, um, where was it? Um, somewhere's getting a blizzard, like in the next couple of days. And I, I think it was Maine, but I saw it and I was like, oh, I felt so bad. Uh, so some areas are still getting blizzards and you're not getting a much of a pollen flow. Uh, but even in some of those areas, you get a hot, warm, sunny day and uh, you'll start getting a little bit of a little bit of a pollen trickle. So to back me up on that, kind of here's the leaf out index. So I, I've shown you guys these maps. They're super cool. You can go to the National Phenology, Phenology, Phenology Network, and you can see these maps in real time. Every day they're updated. And this is when uh, you have major leaf out. So you have a major plant leafing out in, in those regions. And then it, the darker the red it is, the earlier it is compared to the seasonal norm. The more blue it is, the later it is compared to the seasonal norm. So interestingly, yeah, I mean, you look at the deep south here and it's late, you know, interestingly, so it, or it was late, it's leafed out now. Um, but then, of course, the, the central U.S. is crazy early, along with a lot of the West Coast. So uh, and then this is the bloom index. This is a little deceitful because it, your bees will start gathering pollen a lot sooner than here. If you were just to glance at this, you'd say, oh, a lot of the states, there's no blooms yet or no pollen flow, this is really uh, when you're seeing some major blooms. So I would say this is more of you've got like a heavy, heavy, heavy duty pollen flow going on and how early or late it is. But even those areas that don't show red or blue right now, often you're still seeing a trickle of pollen, even even though you're not seeing major, major pollen flows. But these are cool little indexes to watch as the spring progresses to see, you know, what's going on in in your in your in your region. So, yeah, I see in the chats, you know, you get somebody saying it's snowing in Wisconsin, somebody saying it's snowing in Reno. I'm so sorry. 
it, spring will come. I promise. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's always got to be a little discouraging. You know, I'm, I'm in Texas and so it's like, Oh yeah, it's blooming and bees are swarming. And you're like, yeah, it's snowing. Um, but uh, you're just getting a sneak peek on what you need to be doing to your bees a month from now, which is kind of cool. So if you're from a more Northern state, um, you know, a lot of times our tips are going to be, you know, a month ahead or so, but uh, that just gears you up for what you need to be doing in a month. And if you're in the far, far South, you might be a little late from some of the things we're saying. So um, take it with a grain of salt, depending on where you're located. Time to start throwing this up. I usually show this once a, once a month. Once we get into spring, it really starts mattering uh, because this can dictate what kind of a uh, honey crop you're going to have. It's not always a direct correlation. Um, overall, the U.S. isn't bad compared to a lot of years. You know, obviously, you've got some states in the upper Midwest that are getting a little uncomfortable. And of course, um, New Mexico got some trouble spots, certainly. Um, overall, not terrible, and there's still time to change, but this is a map I start watching as, as the honey flow approaches. Inside April hives, you know, uh, we, we looked at some April hives in the video, you know, you're gonna see in, in further north, you may only have a couple frames of brood or down south, you're gonna have peak brood production and, uh, and swarms. Okay, this topic is really relevant. A lot, a lot of people are buying bees, making splits. You know, this is the season of increases. So no matter where in the U.S. you are, you know, most people are going to be making splits or buying bees in the month of April or the first half of May. So caring for those hives, caring for those splits, nooks, packages is really, really important. So I've kind of broken it down here. I'm going to talk about splits in just a second. And James and Sherry will be more tonight. But if you if you are purchasing new hives, nooks, or packages, so if you're buying bees, here's the steps I recommend taking. Well, and if you're buying bees from us, then you'll you'll get a link to a free whole hour long presentation on diving into a lot of detail on how to take care of your new bees. Um, if you don't buy bees from us, you can go on to our advanced classes, and I think it's available on there. For me, step one is always feeding within 24 hours. Now, I, I usually want to give them an initial you know, gallon or so of one-to-one -one syrup once I get them home within 24 hours. Um, let them calm down. You know, three to four days after you get them home, um, you're going to, or after you install your package or nook, you know, you're going to go do a more thorough inspection. I don't usually do a thorough inspection right when I get them home. My objective is get them home, get the package installed, get the nook installed, get some food on them, and then leave them alone for three or four days. Then I come back, I check for larva or eggs. Like I said in the video, spotting those eggs is tough, but at least find larva to ensure the queen survived the trip or look for eggs if you had a package to make sure that the queen was accepted. If you don't see eggs or you don't see larva, but you also don't see queen cells everywhere, give it another three, four days and then check back. Um, it's not uncommon to miss eggs on the first day, or if you just installed a package, that queen may not have started laying yet. You know, give it three or four more days. If you go into the unit hive nook package and there's queen cells all over the place with developing larva in them, good chance that queen didn't survive the trip. And then continue feeding, you know, and, and the feeding is the tricky part, right? Depending on the strength of the hive and the weather, you know, a new hive can drink anywhere from one cup to one gallon of syrup per day. And it's going to vary a lot. And the, a hive will often drink as much as they need. Um, but don't, you don't want to overfeed. It, it's, it's less common to see issues with overfeeding in the spring um, than in the summer. But on a, in a, a general rule of thumb is when you look at your hive, you want to see plenty of space for the queen to lay in the brood nest area. So if you're pulling out frames and you've got, you know, brood on the frames, but then every open cell is full of liquid, you know, syrup, basically, you need to back off on the feeding. But if you're looking at frames and they've got brood on them, there's lots of open cells with eggs and larvae or ready for the queen to lay on and you just have honey around the edges, that's fine. You can keep feeding. Um, so the balance is to give them plenty of resources to draw out new comb, but not so much that they overfill the brood nest and, and the queen can't lay. So my goal is you know, for new hives, I want to see those middle four to five frames with at least 
two thirds open space for the queen to lay on. And those outside frames can be all honey, that's fine. But on those middle three, four, three to five frames, um, I want there to be at least two thirds of that frame open for the queen to lay. When the bottom box is 80% drawn comb and 80% full of bees, you're ready to add your second box. And then you can continue feeding. You know, getting to this point can take six weeks for packages, three to four weeks for nooks, or zero to two weeks for a complete hive. But at some point, you should get to where if that, that bottom box is about 80% full, you're ready to add your next box. And, and keep feeding if it's foundation so that those bees can quickly draw out that second box. And then when your second brood box is 80% drawn comb, you're ready to add your first honey super and stop feeding if it's mid-June or before. And, uh, and I would say that's pretty, uh, pretty universal for the southern half of the United States. If you're in the northern half of the United States, then I wouldn't add um, a honey super at, in most cases, you know, past mid-July. So it's about a month later um, that, uh, that, that I wouldn't add a honey super. It might take, you know, you may not add your first honey super in your first year of beekeeping. It may take all the bees effort just to fill up their bottom box, fill up the second box. And then year two is when they'll be ready to uh, draw out or draw out a super and fill it with honey. So if you made splits, so if you're a seasoned pro beekeeper and you're not buying bees and you made splits, then you know here's what I recommend for caring for those splits. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this because I don't wanna steal James and Sherry's thunder, uh, but you're gonna feed and install new queens within 12 to 24 hours after you made your split. And then you're gonna check back within seven to 10 days to make sure the queen you installed is laying. You're going to follow the same process, really. Feed continually until the bottom box is 80% full of bees. Add your second box. Feed until that's 80% full. Then you're going to add your honey supers and stop feeding. So same basic process for all the units if they're, if they're new hives. If you're not making splits, what do you do for established hives this time of year? Um, you know, you're, you really want to um, equalize brood as needed between all your established hives monitor row mites and super when your top box is 80% full of bees. So you're kind of going directly to adding honey supers on established hives uh, because presumably their two boxes are already drawn out. So these are kind of your second year hives. There are your two brood boxes are already drawn out. And as soon as you get to that point that they're 80% full of bees, you're ready for your honey super, which is hopefully going to happen soon, you know, uh, if you've got an established hive. I want to show a video really quickly of Dodie Stillman. So I think Dodie's actually on the call tonight. So thank you, Dodie. Um, but it's it's super relevant because a common, common question is, you know, how should I feed one-to-one -one syrup versus two-to-one syrup? And when should I feed that one-to-one -one versus two-to-one? I think Dodie does a great job of succinctly explaining when to do one-to-one -one versus two-to-one. what to feed your bees. So the two things that you can feed your bees are sugar syrup and pollen patties, but we're gonna talk about sugar syrup right now. They need the carbohydrates. You feed your sugar syrup either one-to-one -one or two-to-one. You have two different options and they're both for two different things, two different times of the years. In the spring for building up your colonies, you're trying to emulate what the bees are finding out there in nature, which will be the nectar. So you want it to be very thin, so it's one-to-one. -one. So anytime you're in the summer months when stuff is blooming, you're trying to emulate them bringing in more nectar. So one-to-one, -one, all summer long. And then, you know, after you pull your honey in July, you start thinking about building up your bees for the winter. Not necessarily changing to two-to-one in July, but you start thinking about it. Because there's probably gonna be another nectar flow um, in the fall, when the fall flowers start to bloom. But when those fall flowers start to pass away, then it's time to start really feeding them the two to one to build them up for winter. And two to one, you're actually emulating honey. So you want it to be thicker. So two parts sugar to one part water. And that's what you feed them um, until it's too cold to feed them anymore, till, till it'll be too cold for them to break cluster and drink cold sugar syrup. 
right? So that's when you want them to have it already stored in their cells so that they can eat it as they work their way up the beehive. There you go. Perfect. That's a perfect explanation of, of when to use each one. Couldn't have, couldn't have said it better. Um, all right, let me jump back to our screen here. Um, another thing, a super helpful thing this time of year is to use Complete B, um, especially if you're trying to get your bees to really grow. Uh, complete B, uh, Complete is really, really helpful. It's what a lot of us feed in the spring. We mix it with our sugar water, and it really um, cleans up the uh, any any uh, foul broods found in the bees, developing bees. The biggest thing we notice is it can really uh, increase the survival rate of larva. You know, a lot of pupa and larva don't survive. Uh, we just don't see it because the bees cannibalize them or pull them out. Um, but with complete, you tend to have a higher survival rate of larva and it ends up in a more robust hive. And so mixing some complete with your syrup, I highly recommend it this time of year. And in the summer during a dearth, you know, bee cleanse is a little bit better. But these are great products. And uh, they're not terribly expensive, in my opinion, well worth the money. Something you can see, and this is something that Complete tends to help with this time of year, is chalk brood. This is what it looks like on the entrance of your hive, or the picture on the right is what you see on the bottom boards of your hive. And this is uh, a result of a fungus infecting your larva, and, and it kind of turns them into this chalky, hard mass, and the bees pull it out. You know, if you just see it in a couple cells in your hive, it's not a big deal. If you're seeing it all over the bottom board, all over the entrance, all in the frames, it's a pretty severe infection. I would um, feed the bees one-to-one -one sugar water with some complete, and uh, many times that does clean it up. It's usually something we just see in the spring months when it's wet and humid, especially in wet, humid springs, we see it more. Uh, and oftentimes when it gets hotter and drier, it clears up on its own. Severe cases can kill a hive just because they have such high larval uh, 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 larval um, death, uh, and and so it, that it can really affect your hive. In most cases, it's not that severe, but uh, it, it it can be in in unusual cases. I've seen them, um, and I say this every time, and I, I it feels crazy, but I've seen bananas clear it up. So if you're on social media much on beekeeping sites about this time of year, you'll start seeing people say, oh, I've got chalk brood, and I sliced the banana in half and put it on my top bars and closed up the hive, and it cleared up uh, cleared up the chalk brood. And, um, you know, most studies show that it doesn't do that, um, but my goodness, every time I try it, it, it seems like it works. <laughs> so it could be that by the time I go back and look at the hive two weeks later, it naturally cleared up on its own, uh, but it certainly doesn't hurt the hive and the bees certainly eat the bananas. So worth, worth a shot. Another thing you might see this time of year is European fowl brood. And this is, you can see in this picture, it's just really discolored larva. It's maybe twisted larva, larva that look really dry, yellow, shriveled. You know, they're not that beautiful, pearly white uh, larva. And, uh, and so that's, you know, a symptom of, or a sign of European fowl brood. When I see this, again, I, I feed them complete one-to-one um, -one sugar water, often fixes itself once the weather warms up. In severe cases that aren't being fixed, you know, requeening the hive can help. Uh, it, can, it can be somewhat genetic. Um, the other thing that can help is treating your bees with Apigard, the thymol-based treatment. That thymol seems to help clean up the European fowl brood as well. Swarms. So James and Sherry did a great job of talking about swarms last month. So I'm not going to dwell on it too long. You can go watch the um, March monthly buzz, but uh, it's certainly peak swarm season. We had a video on it. This little video on the left is a hive pouring out, swarming, pouring out the entrance of a hive that are swarming. Of course, the picture on the right is queen cells all over the place. And, uh, you know, yeah, the video talked about how to spot it and what to do about it but certainly pay attention to swarming. And then we have a bunch of videos on our YouTube channel. Um, one of them is what to do if your hive does swarm, how to take care of it after a swarm. And, uh, and so check those out. But we're certainly in the height of swarm season in the, uh, in the Southern United States. This is a swarm we caught, uh, showed it last month, but swarms can range in size from a softball to a couple of basketballs. And uh, these, this one was particularly, particularly huge. I'm going to jump to, you know what? Dr. Ellis is amazing. 
but I don't think we have time for Dr. Ellis. So I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Ellis, but um, you can go to our YouTube channel and you can watch, uh, you can just search for Swarm's Dr. Ellis on our channel and you can watch this video from Dr. Ellis on swarm prevention. It's really good, but I've only got about 10 minutes left before I, I, we get to James and Sherry. I want to make sure we have plenty of time because they're going over how to split a hive. Um, queen cells versus queen cups. This is really important to know this time of year. You know, you might see queen cups in your hive and they look very similar to these pictures. It's not a problem unless there's something in it. And so anytime I see these in my hive, I just take my hive tool and I open them up and you can see the picture on the right. I've opened up these queen cells or these queen cups and, and you can see there's a larva, there's royal jelly, there's larva in it. So it, it, it's a queen cup. If there's nothing in it, it's a queen cell. If something is being raised in it. And so if there's something that's being raised in it, that's when, you know, something's going on in my hive. It's queenless. They're wanting to swarm. The queen's failing and they're trying to supersede. Um, and so, yeah, anytime I see these, I open them up to see if, if there's something in it. If there is something in it and your hive is packed full of bees and it has eggs and larvae, your hive's getting ready to swarm. If it's a really unhealthy hive with a spotty brood pattern and things don't look good, but you're still seeing eggs and larvae, they're probably superseding their queen. If you don't see eggs or larvae anywhere, they're probably queenless. So that's kind of the three things you can look for. April Varroa um, test. <laughs> April is a, a, a perfect month to treat if you have an issue. So uh, if you have more than two mites per 100 bees, now's the time to do those tests and do a treatment before you put honey supers on to harvest honey. So uh, now is the time. You know, you do the, the most effective method of testing is uh, alcohol wash, which we have videos on on our YouTube channel on how to do an alcohol wash, but a lot of people hate, hate, hate to kill bees, which I totally understand. In that case, a sticky board isn't nearly as accurate, but it'll still give you a good feel for your varroa mite uh, population. Um, go back and watch last month's webinar, and I talked about how to use the sticky board, and we have a video on our YouTube channel on how to do that. We talked about adding second boxes already. The 80% rule, if your first box is 80% full of bees, add your second box. <laughs> so um, tips for drawing out comb. This is a big one. You know, we're always so eager to get our bees to draw out comb, whether it's a brand new hive or we'll put a super foundation on a hive. And, and often the bees move at a pace slower than we would like. Sometimes we have to be patient with our bees. But here are some things to keep in mind if you're trying to keep get bees to draw out comb. Number one, it has to be warm. You're, you have to have enough bees in your hive to completely cover and keep warm the area they're trying to draw out foundation. So if you've got frames of foundation and they're not covered in bees, there is no way that those bees are going to draw out that foundation. There's just not enough bees. The bees have to fully cover the area that they want to draw out, generate heat, heat up that frame, and then they have to be able to mold that wax on that warm frame. If it's a cold frame, that wax is too brittle to mold. And, uh, and, and they, they're going to try to stick it to that foundation and it's just going to get brittle because it's cold. So you have to have a lot of bees. So if you're not seeing bees covering those frames of foundation, your population just isn't good enough yet. So that's kind of the prerequisite, a lot of bees. Extra wax on frames is very helpful. So Putting a second coat of wax on your frames is helpful. If your frames are old and they've been sitting in your garage for a year, you definitely need to recoat those frames with wax to give it that nice fresh wax smell. A rule of thumb for me is if I've got a frame and I cannot smell the beeswax on it, I want to recoat it with wax. If I can smell beeswax on it, that's probably okay. You don't have, you know, the best way is to melt down some beeswax. We, we sell beeswax if you need it. It, to melt down beeswax and then lightly brush it on with a paintbrush onto the frame. If you don't want to go to all that trouble, we also sell just a, a stick of, of wax um, in the shape of a hexagon. And you can just, it's like a big crayon and you can just scrape that wax directly onto the surface of that foundation. 
And that works too. It gives it that great smell of wax. And the bees will take it and rework that wax that's scraped on. It's not quite as effective as brushing the fresh wax on, but um, it's way, way, way easier and still works. So um, you can look up, uh, I think we, I forget what we call it. It's like a wax stick that we sell um, to just scrape on or brush, you know, rub onto that foundation. Works pretty well. Um, if there's not a lot of natural nectar coming in, if you're feeding your bees, it takes about five gallons of syrup for bees to draw out one deep box. So that gives you kind of a ratio to watch for. Um, old or unprotected foundation must be recoded with wax, like I said. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, bees will not draw out comb through a queen excluder. So they won't start drawing out comb. So if you put a queen excluder on your hive, and put an entire box of foundation on top of that queen excluder, the bees will typically not go through that queen excluder to start drawing out wax. So you've got to remove the queen excluder, let bees start drawing out the wax, you know, let them get a piece about the size of what you see on the picture there on three or four frames. Then you can shake the bees out so you make sure the queen wasn't up there, and then put your queen excluder back on, and they'll keep drawing out that foundation. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can, if you have current, if you currently have some comb, this is what I usually do. I checkerboard my honey super. So I'll put one frame of foundation, then one frame of comb, then one frame of foundation, then one frame of comb. And uh, that works so much better because then the bees aren't having to draw an entire box and they move up into it right away because they're that comb is already up there. Um, do not do that in brood boxes. That is only for honey supers. Don't, I, every year I see it. Somebody sends us pictures and they're like, hey, my bees aren't really growing. I don't know what's going on. And we they say, well, send us a picture. And they've got in their brood box, foundation, comb, foundation, comb. And they've broken apart the whole brood nest. And that brood gets too cold at night. There's not enough bees to keep it all warm. Um, you've got to keep brood together in brood boxes. You never checkerboard frames in brood boxes. But in honey supers, perfectly fine. Um, last point is hive strength and excess food are keys to drawing out wax. So if the bees don't have a surplus of food, they're not going to draw out wax. So that's where feeding continually comes in. And then um, if your first box isn't 80% full of bees, don't bother putting another box on. They're not going to draw it out. So you've got to have that ad adequate bee population. Okay, so um, I'm trying to think if I can do this. So I wanted to go over requeening really quickly. Um, I've got go like ahead, five good, minutes. Good, good. Can, okay. Are right, you sure, Sherry? Yeah. I, I think I can do it in five minutes. You've so, got five minutes. <laughs> um, all right. So this is where that recording you guys can go back and watch on YouTube is so helpful um, because I'm going to do some speed talking here. <laughs> you might need to rewatch this recording and uh, slow me down a little bit, but I'm going to, I'm going to blow through requeening so we can uh, get the splits. Okay, signs that it's time to requeen a hive. So my personal opinion is that you should requeen your hive once a year. So I requeen all my hives when I do splits every March and April. Every hive gets a new queen. That, in my opinion, is the best way to do it. Even if a hive looks really healthy and the queen looks great in March and April, pretty good chance she's going to start failing during the honey flow or the middle of the summer, even if she looks good in the spring. So I recommend proactively just requeening everything every year. The easiest time to do that is when you're doing splits. So, but if your hive, if your brood in your hive looks like these pictures, it's way past time. If you've got, you know, this is drone brood on the left. If, if you've got drone brood mixed with all your worker bee brood, that's a problem. Drone brood should be segmented in little groupings. Um, we saw that in our bee yard visit in last month's monthly buzz. Go back and watch that. Um, you shouldn't have it mixed in with all your worker bee brood, which is also what you see on the picture on the right. You kind of got this shotgun brood pattern and this mixing of worker bee brood and drone brood. That's just a sign of a failing queen. So if you, this time of year, you should have nice compact brood patterns. If you've got kind of that shotgun brood pattern, time for a new queen. One of the most challenging aspects of requeening is getting the bees to accept that new queen. She's a foreigner to them. They don't recognize her pheromone. They want to kill her. That's what they're trained to do. If you get a foreign queen in a hive or a foreign bee in a hive, you get rid of it. So here are some things to increase the likelihood of acceptance when you're requeening. Feeding pre and post introduction. 
bees are more likely to accept a new queen if they have a surplus of incoming food, just how it works. So I start feeding one to one sugar water about a week before I requeen or or split. And that gets the bees on a habit of, hey, we've got plenty of food coming in. And then I do the same thing about a week after I make the split or after I requeen. That really helps. I actually recommend installing your new queen within a few hours of removing the old queen. The longer you wait, the more queen cells worker bees are going to raise. And they don't always tear down those cells even once the new queen is released from her cage. And sometimes those cells that they started raising end up hatching out. And the virgin queen will always overpower and kill the adult queen. So this happens a lot. You know, if you wait two or three days to insert that new queen and you don't wipe out all those queen cells that the bees have started raising, um, they might have actually killed that new queen you just introduced. You might not even know it. It just weakens the hive a bit. So I like to install her within a few hours. Um, introducing during a nectar flow certainly helps. I, when I introduce the queen after a few hours, I put a piece of masking tape over that candy um, for about 24 hours. And then, um, then I pull that masking tape off and, uh, and that allows them to basically that queen stays in the cage an extra day. Um, my goal is for her to be in that cage for four days or so before she's released by the bees. Smaller hives also accept queens more readily. So the first step is finding and killing the queen. That's the worst part. We all hate it. Um, it's also the hardest part, finding those queens. I have a video, if you go to our YouTube channel, I have a video on how to find a queen. And guys, the queens have conspired against me the last couple of days because yesterday I went into a bee yard and, and I want to redo the, the queen, the how to find a queen video we have on our YouTube channel is perfectly adequate. It's just, uh, it was like one of the very first videos I ever made and the audio isn't great. The, vi the video quality is fine, but the audio isn't great. Um, and I was like, okay, I'm going to redo this video. And, uh, and so yesterday I went into a bee yard and I I'd had like 10 minutes and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I opened up a hive. I start talking through all my tips and like halfway through the hive, I realized it's a queenless hive. I was like, oh shoot, I can't show you how to find a queen in a queenless hive. And I, I, I was out of time. So I was like, okay, I'm just, I can't do this. I have to do it tomorrow. And then, so today uh, I saved that video to the very end and I was like, okay, I'm going to do it today. I start filming it. I get halfway through. And it's another queenless hive. <laughs> and I had to I had to leave the bee yard to go jump on this call. So two times I've tried to redo that video. Um, hasn't happened. Maybe next month. But go onto the YouTube channel, watch the video on how to find a queen. It, audio isn't great, but you'll get the idea. Um, and uh, I share share all my favorite tips on how to requeen a hive. But step one, find and kill the queen. Um, whoops, sorry. Uh, I recommend before you kill your queens, have your new queens in hand because it's crazy common for queen breeders to call two days before and say, oh yeah, we something happened and your queens are going to be three days late. That's really, really, really common, especially in late March or early April. Or you get your queens, you get home with them or they, you get them in the mail and the queen's dead. That's super common too. So make sure you've got your live queen in hand and she looks good. Then go out, kill your queen and put that new queen in within a couple hours. The placement of the cage, um, see if that video clears up a little bit. The cage goes just like that. So the, the queen, the candy side can go up or down. I usually actually put it down, but it, the screen, you want the screen fully exposed so the bees can talk to their new queen and uh, they can interact with it. And then you're just gonna shove that new cage down between the frames. I focus on making sure that that cage is uh, kind of in the heart of bee activity. So you don't want that, that uh, cage way out to one side of the brood box. You want it kind of in the heart of the hive where the most of the bees are. And that's just so that more bees will be exposed to her so they can spread her pheromone around. But then uh, I also wanna make sure she stays warm on chilly nights. So some common questions are uh, how often to requeen? We already answered that once a year. Uh, queens versus queen cells. I recommend mated queens. 
queen cells are fun and cheap, but much more complicated. I actually take the dead queen out. Some people kill that old queen and leave her in the hive, but she's still giving off pheromones if she's in that hive, even if she's dead, which is going to make it lower for the bees to realize they're queenless. So I always remove that old queen, pull her out so that pheromone's depleted. It'll be depleted within a couple hours. The bees will realize they're queenless, and that's when you can put that new queen in. I usually requeen in the spring. The fall is perfectly fine. I just like to requeen when I'm doing splits. So I usually do spring. Um, and uh, yeah, so check backs. If you're for mated queens, I wait about seven days. The first thing I look at is that queen cage and make sure she is released. And uh, if she was, then I quickly look for eggs. If I don't see eggs, I'm not that concerned. Um, I come back in three or four days and look for eggs and larvae again. If you use queen cells, you're going to wait 14 to 21 days to look for eggs. Uh, one to two eggs per cell is pretty common. In, in For new laying queens, you shouldn't see more than two. If you're seeing four or five, six, seven, eight, then you have a drone layer or laying workers, which is a whole nother conversation. Um, but those are what you're going to look for. Um, some helpful videos. These are the titles on our YouTube channel, when to requeen, find a queens, how to find a queen when you can't find a queen. That's a cool video. So if you really just cannot find a queen, what should you do? Um, check out that video as well. I'll try to remember to link these. You know, we always send a summary email out a couple days after the monthly buzz webinar. I'll try to remember to include all these video links in, in that one. Um, I'm going to write myself a note while James and Sherry are, are talking. So um, let's see. Oh, James and Sherry, I thought I had an intro screen for you guys. Sorry. Um, I guess that didn't make the final cut. So uh, you'll just have to share your screen and uh, no intro. Hey, no intro screen today. Time. Taking your time. time. No introduction screen. It's, I'm just a mess. <laughs> Right. You know, one thing I learned from that was a coin in the hand is worth a dozen in the bush. Oh. <laughs> or in the VR, right? Or in the VR. Queens in hand are crucial for split. <laughs> well, it's so true. It's so oh. true. Is that funny or what? Okay. I won't do this. Let's see if I can get this right. Sherry has work to do here for a moment. I do. Okay. There we go. Let's see if it works. Very good. I well, think it worked. Okay, it did. Welcome, everyone. How are you? Hi, Sherry and James. And we're going to do kind of a uh, condensed version of splits where we drill down to something really basic for what we call small-scale beekeepers, new beekeepers. Some terminology may not be familiar with what uh, uh, we've talked about so far, so we'll we'll try to simplify some. We've heard some really good um, good suggestions so far. We surely have. So let's let's start with what is what is a split? As if that hasn't been discussed. I think we've probably uh, discovered that a split is simply a division of an existing colony and turning it into two or more colonies. Mm -hmm. um, you can look at the uh, boxes that are out in that field mm -hmm. and see where there's a lot of split opportunities there. Like that first box in the center there mm -hmm. with three deeps on it. Mm -hmm. uh, that could possibly turn into... One, two, three, four, five, six splits. <laughs> Who knows? Could. So there's a lot of opportunity, but it's the division of the assets mm -hmm. to accomplish what the, growing your apiary, growing correct. your apiary, right? And to stop swarming, like has been said. Well, you know, it's also great for offsetting losses. Yeah. And as Blake was saying earlier, for uh, varroa control, splits are a great mm. brood break. Mm. So true. So let's get ready to make our split. Okay. The very first thing, and I, I will tell you that in years past, years and years and years ago, we felt underprepared for bullet point number one, but you really and truly need to spend some real time for new beekeepers, and if you're new to doing splits, to get your new hive equipment ready and paint it ahead of time. You do not want to go paint that box a few days before your bees arrive. I mean, your uh, queens arrive. So you, you need that paint to dry, you need to get it um, kind of, what would you call it, facto baked on there. It needs to be good and good and set. Then you don't want really high odors on your hive that you're fixing to split into. And, you know, part of that first item, uh, do you know which size box you're going to be splitting into? Mm -hmm. If it's a small colony, maybe a single deep, 
then you might be going into two nukes. That's true. If it's a double deep, you might be going into an additional 10 frame or eight frame mm -hmm. box. That's true. So make that decision ahead of yeah. time and don't get caught where you're installing a small number of these in a very large box. That's right. That's right. All right. Get your new queen secured either to make your own, and we're going to talk about that, or pre-order it. Um, you know, folks have been ordering queens since we put them on sale in September. So you really and truly can plan, plan way ahead for that. Or like I just said, we're going we're to show you how to make your own as an option as well. And then when do we do spring uh, splits? Obviously now is the best time because we've got so much going in our favor, right? Well, it stands to reason if, if swarms occur during spring when nectar <laughs> flows are, then that's the time for us to to uh, mimic that split. Sure. Uh, a split is nothing more than a man-made swarm. That's right. So we want to do it when they're doing it or actually mm -hmm. before they're doing it. Right, before they're doing it for certain. So we can do summer and fall split, splits and we'll talk about that uh, again later on in the year. It's just with some adjustments. They have to be stronger splits. That last bullet point we put in there because if you really need to make a honey crop out of this hive, then you're going to need to be on the ball and do that six weeks before the primary nectar flow. That way you can be certain to get a honey crop. Otherwise, you're going to be behind. You're going to be behind. You're, you're, they're going to be building. It's going to be fine. The splits are going to work, but you're going to be building bees and not, not building honey on that because it takes 43 days from egg to becoming a forager. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, and that's your, that's your population building mm -hmm. uh, for harvesting that nectar. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk about the two most common splits. You know, the, the, the type of split that a beekeeper makes is totally dependent on whether you're able to locate the queen, mm -hmm. you want to locate the queen, mm -hmm. if it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. or if you're going to install the new queen. Mm -hmm. That gives us direction that we need to focus on. So the two that we're going to do are, and we've done a lot of different kinds, but we picked out these two particular ones because I believe it's, well, first of all, it's the million two that we use because we are much smaller than uh, Desert Creek Honey's bee yard, I assure you. So we're not doing, how many did Blake say? A thousand uh, splits in a day that a commercial beekeeper can make? Well, we don't need that many. So let us talk about what we, what we do, the two options we choose. And the first one being a walkaway split. And these are easy peasy, y'all, easy. It's really as easy as this math makes it look. You're going to take, and I did a little, um, we'll call it graphic art. And when I first clicked this slide, that uh, checkered ho uh, uh, the hexagon turned on the one day old larva. You have to have one frame that contains one day old larva. Why you ask? Because that's your new queen. That's your new potential queen in a split. Okay, because I we didn't say go find your queen, did we? We started off exactly with one plus two plus two. So that is where you're going to start is having a frame of one day old larva. Then you're going to add two frames of captain emerging brood plus two frames of pollen and honey and nectar. And that re-emphasizes what we discussed earlier mm -hmm. in previous videos in that. We're looking for a minimum of three to four frames mm -hmm. of available brood. Right. And they need to be a mixture because if we're not locating the queen, then that colony has to have the opportunity to make a queen. Right. And queens come from that one day old cell. That's right. And you have to have that in multiples of them, not just, you know, a little small section. You need to be very particular that you're getting a good, nice, good frame of open brood. And that is so important because... The one larva does not have to not queen mate. No. They need the opportunity to, to be, it's kind of like car shopping. <laughs> <laughs> we need to kick the tires and see yeah. which one we want. We're going to make several. We're going to make several. So now you, this is the layout. It's just literally just like you've installed a nuke. You're going to pull those frames. You see my diagram there. Honey's the solid yellow, the honey pollen's variegated, and then the brood pollen's the patchwork. So you're going to put those the the open larva frame in the middle, and then the uh, uh, capped nearly emerging frame and the regular brood frame on either side of that, and then the resource frames to the outside. Whether that's going into a nuke box or into a full size ten frame or eight frame box, okay. We, we focus on keeping the frames 
in the same order mm -hmm. that they came out of the, the mother colony? If you can, yes. When possible, if not, yeah. then you need to duplicate keeping like items together, right. brood to brood, pollen mm -hmm. to pollen, just like right. it shows. That's right, that's right. So we didn't worry about where the queen was, right? But we have to now. So open both splits in four to five days. And I can't tell you how many times we've done these. And this works beautifully. Actually, if they're in the same location, you'll know, wink, wink, you'll know where the queen is because a lot of the foragers will head back to that one, which is fine. Oh, so you're saying we didn't, in that case, we didn't. We didn't, the we didn't, but you we can. Left it in place. We did. Now, that was just a tip, okay? But is there a queen cell being made? You want to be able to see which one is making one and make sure both of them, so let's say you made two splits. If both of them are making queen cells, what does that tell you? I heard somebody, they said that means you didn't have a queen. That's exactly what that killed the queen yeah. while we're making that split. That's what I kind of probably yeah. meant. But if yes, if I see those queen cells in that one, because I didn't, I didn't order me a queen, I'm going to let them raise this one at least until I can secure a queen, a nice, good, genetically good queen, then I'm going to check back three to four weeks. Why am I going to wait three or four weeks? I've got to wait 16 days for it from egg to emergence is 16 days for a queen. And it's going to take her another five or ish days, five to seven days to get out, get mated and come back and start laying. And it's good. That's going to take time. So you're looking at a month. You see how long you've got to wait to generate your own queen in a split as opposed to purchasing a queen. But there's times that you've got to make a split and you don't have a queen. And there are times that that, um, split then accomplish queen cell like that there it is what <laughs> if there isn't a queen cell then you're really going to need to kind of regroup you're going to either add another uh, frame of one day old larva which we've done that um but you can also just by this point you this this is a, a week later you should probably have at least made a phone call where you can hedge your hedge your bets there and you can add an, a purchase queen which is ideal but if not, then maybe you've got a swarm cell or a queen cell from another colony or from a friend, a beekeeper friend. Or, and, that, and that last bullet point, I would be willing to, to stop. To say, you know, sometimes we realize that something happened. Our mm -hmm. selection of, of uh, foundation was incorrect. Mm -hmm. the population something. wasn't large enough. We didn't have enough nurse bees. Who knows what the reason is? Mm -hmm. But time to cut your losses, mm -hmm. restore what you've done, mm -hmm. and salvage that original colony. Right. And and there's nothing wrong with that, y'all. Just put it back with the other one. It's really okay. Make sure there's not any, you know, queen cells that were started, though. All right. Make sure that. So now we've that it migrates us to typical split. A typical split is what it's typical. It's the same thing that we just, it's typical, is what we just talked about. You can do it exactly the same way. Um, with the one, the two, and the two to equal five, but you are going to actually find the queen first because you're going to requeen not only your existing hive, but you're also, you're going to insert a queen into the split. And I guess there's, you don't have to requeen your existing hive, but I'm with Blake on requeening every year. We requeen every year unless there's an outstanding reason not to. This is your opportunity. You're already breaking them down. Find the queen. And like Blake said, we have YouTube videos of finding the queen and requeening that are very good. Um, this is when you're going to introduce that new queen to the split. It will speed up the process by three weeks. In addition to that, it gives you a, that pre-mated queen has mm -hmm. genetics that are different than what you're probably going to get in your own bee yard. You think? And hopefully it's going to be a much more docile, um, yes. highly organized queen and that they're, yeah. they're heavy brood producers or heavy, heavy honey producers mm -hmm. selected according to what your goals are. Well, in our area, we don't want, we want to avoid doing homegrown queens because we are not in a conducive area. Africanized bees are around and they tend to not be very sweet bees. So when we do walk away splits, it's typically because we've just not gotten our hands on queens yet, but yet we have to make a split. But you can certainly do that, make that walk away, and then get your queen and go in and requeen that uh, walk away later. But typical split, you can, um, and James can 
how many times have you made a split out of a, a double deep hive? You've made three or four splits out of one double deep. Well, and, and that's beautiful when you're when you are available or when the resources are available yeah. to accomplish that. Sure. But what you have to have more so than just the appropriate resources mm -hmm. is lots of nurse bees. Lots so of you bees. need to be willing to provide additional bees mm -hmm. from other colonies mm -hmm. to help assist you in that process. So true. So true. All right. So moving your splits. And I alluded to the fact that we may may not. Depending on what your situation is, a lot of you are backyard beekeepers and you've got to make a split. Um, and you don't have a pasture that you can move it on the other side. If you can move it down the road, then that's great. But if you can't, then there's options. Just turn the entrance opposite from its original orientation from where you split that off. Um, multiple times have we had beekeepers do that where you've got the original location. And I mean, you can move it as far as you can away from that original parent hive, but then just reorient that uh, that entrance to that split the other direction. It really does work for the most part because most of the bees were flying. They'll go back to that original location. If side by side, and I'll even say, even if they're not, if they're moved a little away from each other, you can swap those boxes after a few days to equalize the foragers. One thing's for certain in that the, the existing bees within any colony or any box, they're going to try or attempt to return to the mother colony. They are. So if it's left, right, doesn't matter, that's where the population of bees mm -hmm. is going to be. So mm -hmm. our goal would be to balance the population the and best that we can. And it does work. It, it does works very well. Job. With and moving splits, job. yes, it's great to move them. Uh, we had a question a while ago, someone was going to move them two hours away. Well, those bees are not going to fly back to the regular length <laughs> no. So that's not a problem. Fair enough. But we had discussions on um, how to move bees properly. Oh, you did? That's really important. Y'all check that out in the, in the Q&A. Uh, managing your new split. Uh, keep the entrance reduced. I guess I should say reduce the entrance until the colony gets established. And then that's gonna take a couple of weeks. If it's, especially if it's a small split, because you've weakened that colony, you put a stressor on it, it's new. What if it's still trying to generate a queen or even if it's still, it's got that queen cage in there, you know, big splits where it's a side by side, where you just take the top box and set it to the side, double deep. That might be one that you could have it open before two weeks, but, Really, in most cases, just keep it where they can guard that entrance um, and feed your split. Feed, 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 feed. If the, uh, if the split goes into a, a box that has undrawn foundation, mm -hmm. feeding is what's necessary to, mm -hmm. to get that foundation drawn. Mm -hmm. the, it, unlike a, uh, a swarm where the bees come in loaded with honey to make right. wax, uh, these bees are just, just a colony that's doing its daily, daily duties. Daily so duties. They don't have excess bellies full of... Right full of uh, nectar to make new wax. So we have to give them some assistance. Uh, Dodie did a, a fine job, great job of describing the one to one versus two to one. Right. And it's one to one that you're gonna wanna do on feeding all new hives. All new hives you're gonna do one to one. Okay, that day, you went that, out. That, you go out, it is a sad day. Do you love that box? If y'all watch the magazine, you've seen me use this poor little box. <laughs> I know it's an upside down box. Somebody wrote me a letter once and they said, do you know that is an upside down box with two pine knots in it? Yes, I know that, but it's a sad face. I love it. And I'll keep using it by gosh, by golly. I love that face. Um, if your split is failing to grow, there's something wrong. And you, you are the only one that can fix it. So we've got to go in and we've got to kind of check out what, what's happening. Um, verify you do have a laying queen, whether that was a purchased, installed, mated queen, or you had you self-generate, had the hive generate their own queen. It could be that she didn't mate well, either scenario, because as well as our suppliers are, including us, PBS, Things can happen. It's nature. We, you know, nature's not perfect and queens can fail. So if something happens that you're high, the, the, the growth of it is going to be the first to show you that something went wrong. Okay. Well, in addition to that, uh, queens can be damaged along the way. Queens can. can be mishandled. I hate to admit it, but uh, most of us are, are 
fairly um, inexperienced beekeepers. All and thumbs. We do things. <laughs> so we learn as we go yeah. and uh, ensure that what's happening um, uh, is suitable to what your goals are. Mm. Don't allow uh, pests and disease to move in. All in right. a, in a um, I'm thinking more small high but don't but don't allow, don't allow the colony uh, to yeah. succumb to the pests and disease. Varroa mites, yes. That could be a cause for a colony to not take off like sure, it's supposed for sure. to. Well, and if you didn't, if you didn't have your mites under control when you made the split, and you know, we didn't talk about that, but it's very clear in in your hive whether you you only split good healthy hives. Because if you take an unhealthy hive and you split it, you're gonna have two unhealthies. And the odds are neither one of them are gonna do well. Um, so make sure that that's in check first, but it could be a reason that the hive doesn't do well. And I, I forgot to put that in here, but small hive beetles is a major threat to a split. Um, because you have weakened that hive, it's less bees in there. Um, small hive beetles can be very, very much a problem. That item number four, uh, bee population imbalance, Big. that uh, specifically is, is referring to where's the balance between your, your forager bees and your um, nurse bees. Uh, nurse bees. Mm -hmm. If we made a split, and shook our nurse bees off uh, and just tried to move foundation or drawn foundation over in the split. Oh, yeah. And then what's going to repopulate that is likely to be nothing more mm -hmm. than forager bees. And forager bees is not a healthy colony. It does not. So or only forager bees. <laughs> right. Because they can't nurse the the up, up and coming bees. So switch locations. If you if you see that you're not growing resource wise, I would think that that was it. And the population um, you can also, if you really feel like you're not getting going good, shake more nurse bees in there. That can be very intimidating. I can tell you we've done it. And in the beginning, it was very, I was worried that we were going to um, get the queen. You don't want to shake the new queen off in there because you obviously have cleared that other first couple of, of bullet points. So make sure you don't take your good queen off and put her in there, but shake just nurse bees in there. And that often can help between the two. Um, and I didn't also didn't put this on here, but if you need population, you can take a full frame of capped about to emerge, which is dark brown, dark brown frames, and put that uh, a frame of almost emerging brood, and that'll give you a population boost within just a matter of days. Yeah, I still go back though to the very first one, verify you have a laying queen right. and yeah. that it's a queen that is properly mated mm -hmm. and it's not a queen that you 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 allowed to mate locally and if so yeah. she may or may not be able to mm -hmm. be up to the job right so there you that's go the bulk of it that's all we've got we just came under the wire that was great thank you guys welcome love that uh, let me get my screen back up here Perfect. Well, thank you guys for presenting that. That was super, super helpful. Um, and right on time. Thank you for getting me back on time. That's uh, quite a feat. So thanks for doing that. Um, well, guys, that's it for tonight. Um, we'll be sending an email out tomorrow, Saturday, Monday, somewhere in there uh, when we get to it. <laughs> That'll have the uh, link to the recording, um, links to the videos I talked about, the products I talked about, and of course, to the Bee Supply magazine. And uh, just a little uh, hack that you may not be aware of. I usually actually get the uh, the recording up on our YouTube channel, usually Thursday night, tonight, um, or certainly by tomorrow. So that's usually on there or on our website first before the email goes out. But thank you for giving us your Thursday evening. Um, it's great to spend the time with all of you. And thank you for all of you that are going back and watching this recording. Uh, we appreciate your time and we will see you in May. Have a great day, everyone.